Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. This is the eighth episode of my tutorial series on Z80 assembly language development, targeting the Sinclair ZX Spectrum to learn how to program a simple system starting at the very lowest level. If you haven't seen the earlier episodes, I strongly encourage you to go back to my channel and don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when the next episode comes out and start this playlist from the beginning. So far in this series, we have learned the basics of assembly language and all the instructions that deal with data and registers and memory and how to transform and move that data between those places. However, no computer is a completely closed system. They all need to have some means of input and output to perform their tasks. For many 8-bit processors, like the 6502, these interfaces are mapped to memory addresses, but the Z80 does things a different way. The Spectrum, like many other Z80-based systems, uses ports for input and output, or I.O. for short. Ports have addresses just like memory, but they are completely separated from memory, so that the entire 16-bit memory space can be used for RAM and ROM, and no address needs to be reserved for I.O. The Z80 has a dedicated pin for I.O. requests, and when that is held low by the CPU, the address, data, and read and write pins should be routed to some sort of I.O. control circuit instead of memory. In the case of the Spectrum, I.O. requests are routed to different components based on the port address on the address pins, but mostly handled by the ULA chip. The ULA is an uncommitted logic array, which is an old-school version of a modern FPGA, but with far fewer gates that can be configured. The ULA, with the firmware designed by Sinclair, handles the interfaces with the video controller, keyboard, and the beeper, in addition to handling pages between different memory banks for later Spectrum models. If the low bit of the port address is clear, in other words, an even address, then it is getting routed through the ULA, and then the upper byte of the port address specifies which attached device we are connecting to, while the lower byte of the address is always hex FE. Ports with odd addresses are for I.O. with other devices, but we won't get into that in this video. Topics like serial communication and tape and disk interfaces deserve their own episodes. Something we have not seen yet in this series is any kind of input to a program. For something like a demo, that's completely expected, but chances are you want to write software that is interactive, like a game. To do that, you will need to process input, and most likely from the keyboard, which is the only input device that a Spectrum user is guaranteed to have. So to read the state of the keyboard, you need to input from port FE, as the keyboard is connected to the Z80 through the ULA. To do this, we can use the IN instruction, which has two arguments. Like the LOAD instruction, the first argument is the destination of the read value, which in this case needs to be an 8-bit register. The second argument is the port address, specifically the low byte of the port address. The high byte of the port address is implied by the addressing mode of the second argument, which will either be a hard-coded address or the C register, in parentheses in both cases. If a hard-coded address is used, then the high byte of the address will be taken from the accumulator, which also must be the destination of the read byte. If C is used, then the high byte will come from B, so you can just load the complete 16-bit address into BC before the IN instruction. Using C for the port address also lets you have more options for the first argument, where you can specify any of these registers as the destination. Besides the input value being read into the register, condition flags may be set. But if you are using a hard-coded port address, the flags are unaffected, even though the value in A is likely to change. However, if you are using C for the address, then the H and N bits will be cleared, S is set for negative values, Z is set for zero, and PV is used for parity. The carry bit is never affected in any case. Rather than having a keyboard buffer, the Spectrum provides the Z80 with the current states of all the keys through port FE. Only the lower five data bits from this port will contain key states. And while the Spectrum has very few keys, there are more than five. So the set of keys to be read is specified by the upper byte of the port address. As there are 40 keys, there are 8 different upper bytes for port FE to specify for each input. The table here shows which keys are read by inputting from which addresses. When a key is pressed, if you input the corresponding port, the read byte will show the corresponding bit to be clear. 
The default state for the keys is to have their bits set when not being pressed. For example, if someone were trying to type a capital M, we would see bit 0 clear when reading from FEFE -FE for the shift key, and bit 2 clear when reading from 7FFE for the M key. So if you were to write a routine to monitor the keyboard, you would have to do 8 inputs and handle each clear bit you read. Let's take a look at what that would entail. Let's read the whole keyboard state and store it in some registers. By using the alternate registers, we can fit the entire keyboard state in registers and keep A and HL free for other use. This code will fill up B, C, D, and E in both the main and alternate registers, with the lower five bits in each containing unique key states, being clear if the corresponding key is pressed while being read. First, we want to use an immediate port address, starting with hex FEFE. -FE. So we need to start by loading the high byte of the address into A. Then we do the input with the lower byte of the address in the second operand, and this will overwrite A with the value that was read, which contains the states for the V, C, X, Z, and caps shift keys. We want to keep that value in A, so we move on to using register addressing, which means we need to load B, C with the next port address, then input it to the D register, which will have more key states. We can keep hex F, E, and C, as that will be the lower address of all the keys, since we're going through the ULA. We just need to keep changing the upper address in B, so we load the next there and do another input, this time into E. We keep doing this with two more ports, and load key states into H and L. We don't want to keep those there, so we copy those values to B and C now that we're done with the inputs. We do an EXX to swap out the alternate registers, so now the last four key state bytes we read are safely stored in the alternate B, C, D, and E registers. Now we can safely populate the registers again, loading up BC with the next port address and inputting that into D. And C is all set again, so we just have to put the high byte of the next address into B, and we read that into E. Then we get to the last address, which we read into H, then copy that into B now that we are completely done with our inputs. Finally, we copy that first byte of key state data that's been sitting in A the whole time into C, and we're done. Now we can have full use of A and HL and their alternates, and test relevant key states in other registers as our program requires. Now let's look at the other side of ports. How do we output? Well, we have the OUT instruction, and it works very similarly to IN, except that the arguments are reversed. The port address now comes first, and it can be immediate as long as the second argument is A. This means that A does double duty as the source of the data to output, as well as the upper byte of the address. Luckily, a lot of ports on the spectrum don't require the upper byte of the address to be specified, like the ULA, which will be hit with any even address, so only bit 0 of the lower byte matters. And that's why you can just specify hex FE as the immediate port address, and that's good enough. The upper byte of the address in A is effectively ignored, and the value in A is only written to the ULA as data. Other devices will require specific bits in that upper address byte, so you'll need to use indirect register addressing in those cases, again using BC for the address. The second argument, specifying the data source, can be any of the registers that can be used as the data destination for IN. Additionally, you can also just specify 0 instead of a register, which is an undocumented instruction, but can come in handy when you just want to clear an output port without having to load zero into a register. The only sound device on the original spectrum was a piezoelectric beeper connected through the ULA, and you can set its simple binary state using bit 4 of port FE. This means the only possible sound is a square wave with fixed amplitude, but variable pulse width and frequency from cycle to cycle. If we want to output a fixed tone that approximates middle C at 261.6 Hz, we need to output a new cycle every 3.8226 milliseconds, which comes out to 13,380 T states with our 3.5 MHz C80. To have the purest possible tone, we need to have a 50% duty cycle, meaning that the output should be high only half the time, or 6,690 T states. Then low again for the same amount of time, and keep repeating for the duration of the tone. If you think this means a lot of busy work for the CPU and instruction counting for the developer, you would be correct. This is a very difficult way to produce sound, 
taking a lot of resources away from a game if it wants to have background music. This is why the 128K version of the Spectrum added the AY38912 sound generator chip, which is accessible by writing register values using two different output ports. With that, you have access to multiple channels, and you can just set them to a specific waveform and let them play without intervention from the CPU until the waveform needs to change or stop. As this tutorial series is focused mainly on the 48K spectrum, we won't be going into this chip in further detail. If that's something you are interested in, let me know in the comments, and maybe I can do a special episode on that in the future. We can use interrupts to control the timing of music and the changing of frequency and pulse width. But on the spectrum, our interrupts are tied to the PAL TV signal, meaning we only get 50 interrupts a second. So if we want to deal with sound only in interrupts, the highest frequency we can attain is 25 Hz, which is pretty low but still audible. So let's do just that. Play a 25 Hz tone by changing the beeper state every interrupt. This means it will be high for one PAL frame, low for the next, and keep repeating to keep the tone going at a consistent 25 Hz. All we need to do is enable interrupts, then initialize C with hex FE to start outputting to the ULA. Each loop we flip bit 4 in the accumulator by doing an XOR with hex 10. Then do a halt to wait for the next interrupt, which will wake our program back up. Then we output the new A to the ULA, which will flip that bit for the next frame, which will be another half cycle of our waveform. Then we jump back to the top of the loop to flip the bit again and wait for the next interrupt. This is as simple as playing a sound can get on the original Speccy, and the results are less than impressive. In a later lesson, we'll look into how to make more sophisticated sound with this extremely simple device. The Z80 also provides some convenience instructions for doing mass inputs that aren't particularly convenient for the spectrum. NI does an input and increment by loading data from a port specified by BC into a byte in memory whose address is in HL. It then increments HL and decrements B, which will go to a new port and do double duty as a counter, so that when B gets down to zero, the Z bit will be set. It is the fastest way to input a value directly to memory, but the register modifications may still need to be dealt with. It is really meant to be used as part of a loop, and you can use the INIR instruction to automatically repeat NI until B gets down to zero. However, the Spectrum doesn't have input ports that sit nicely on successive addresses. Using this to read the keyboard would take up a massive amount of unnecessary time and memory. It's more meant for ports that can be quickly read successive times that don't depend on a specific upper byte of the address to B and B. Unfortunately, a stock spectrum doesn't have an input port that can be used like this, but it is possible that a peripheral could, and this would be useful for reading and streaming data that has extremely low latency. If you want to read this data into memory, but going backwards, you can use the ND or INDR instructions, which will decrement HL after every input. There are corresponding loop instructions for output 2, without I outputting data from memory to a port and incrementing HL and decrementing B. Or you can use OTIR to automatically repeat out I until B gets down to zero. Of course, this would require a device that can handle streaming from the spectrum at its maximum rate, which is also not part of the stock unit. You can do this while decrementing HL, also with the OUTD or OTDR instructions. Because of these instructions' limited utility, we will be using only the regular IN and OUT instructions in this tutorial series. For our example program, we are going to simply use the Spectrum as a device that will play a tone while you press the X key. What does this look like? Well, embedded applications need no screenshots. Let's just go right into the code. As usual, we are specifying the 48K Speccy and starting our code at hex 8000. We don't need any data, so we're going to get right into the code. First, we initialize BC with a port that reads the X key, which is hex FEFE. -E. This will also work for outputting sound, so we don't need to touch B or C again. We're going to use the D register to store the value we are currently outputting to the ULA, which will be zero initially. Then we go right into our loop, where we start by reading from the port to get the current key states, which we store in A. 
If bit 2 is set, then X is not being pressed, so we want to shut off the tone by jumping ahead to dot sound off. If bit 2 is clear, then X is being pressed, and we continue on to load the current output value from D into A. Then we flip bit 4 with an XOR, and save that value back to D for later retrieval, and skip ahead to dot output. If we jump to dot sound off earlier, then we want to force the output to be 0 by just loading that into A, rather than having its bit 4 flipped. We continue on to dot output where in all cases we finally send the new value in A to the ULA. Before we continue the next iteration of the loop, we want to delay to allow the next half cycle of the waveform we may be outputting to continue. Instead of doing a halt until the next interrupt, which will give us that ultra low 25 Hz tone again, we want to only wait for 2000 T states, which we can easily accomplish by inserting 500 no ops into the code. Since our program does literally nothing more, we can just go ahead and waste this time and 500 bytes of memory. SJASM Plus lets us do this in a single line with a repeat directive, which simply uses a dot followed by the repeat count and then the instruction to repeat. Delaying these 2000 T states at 3.5 MHz will give us a half cycle of about 0.57 milliseconds. A total cycle of 1.14 milliseconds will give us a square wave with a frequency of about 877 Hz, which is close to the second A above middle C, so a nice bright sound. After the delay, we can just continue the loop ad infinitum, so no need to return. The spectrum will just keep waiting for you to hit X and play a sound until you reset. We'll deploy this code by generating a snapshot named io.sna, and to do this, we have a build script. We just call sjasm plus with the LST option to generate a machine code listing to see all 500 of those beautiful no-ops, and then pass it the name of our assembly file, io.asm. Now let's go to the terminal and run it. We run build.sh and do a directory listing and see that the io.sna snapshot file is there. So let's load it into the emulator. We're using Fuse again, so we hit F3 and select io.sna and let it run. As expected, the screen is blank and nothing appears to be happening. If I hold down X, we hear the tone. Release X and it stops. Nothing happens when I hit any of the other keys, but I can keep hitting X to hear that sound. And that's all we have for this lesson. There are many other devices for the spectrum that we can use like this, both built-in and external peripherals, and we'll get into some of those in future episodes. In the linked GitHub repo, you'll find not only this code, but all of the code examples for each lesson, and all of the slides presented in the series. In the README, you'll also find links to some additional materials that can help explain what's going on and provide some needed background in case your programming experience is a bit limited. Please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to be notified when the next episode comes out. And please like this video if you learned anything, and let YouTube know that you want to see more tutorials like this. If you can't wait for the next episode to go public, join our Patreon community and see my videos ad-free as soon as they are uploaded, just like the people you see here. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.